This week's topic is the respiratory system. When we look at the respiratory system, major function of the respiratory system is gas exchange. All cells in the body need oxygen, and all cells in the body release carbon dioxide as a waste product of metabolism. Therefore, we need the respiratory system to bring fresh oxygen into the body and deliver it to the cells and get rid of that waste carbon dioxide with our exhale. So the respiratory system really works together with the cardiovascular system to make sure our blood is well oxygenated and we're getting rid of that waste gas carbon dioxide. So the term inspiration refers to inhalation. It's the movement of air from the outside of the body into the lungs through the various passageways that we'll discuss. And expiration is a movement of air out of the body from the lungs and those airways. So looking at some terms, ventilation is just a term for the movement of air in and out of the body. So when a patient is put on a ventilator, we're just helping that uh, patient deliver air from the outside inside the body and exhaling it out again. That usually is for patients that have had some kind of um, nervous system issue or brain damage that they're not allowed to a lot, not able to move air efficiently, or they have severe lung disease that they need extra support to move air through diseased lungs. <clears throat> but again, we need that cardiovascular system to transport the oxygen from the lungs to the tissues and the carbon dioxide from the tissues to the lungs because we know that cellular respiration requires oxygen to, for cells to survive, to break down glucose, and in the process it releases carbon dioxide as a waste gas. So when you look at the respiratory tract, I have another picture, it's from your textbook, it's a little closer up here. We can look at this one here, it kind of gives a function of every structure along the way. Uh, the function of the nasal cavity as air comes in through the nose is to filter the air with the cilia that line this mucous membrane of the nasal cavity so that filters the, filters the air and traps you know suspended particles in the air. It warms the air with the blood vessels that are near the surface in the nasal cavity and it moistens it with the water content found in the mucus of our mucous membrane in the nasal cavity. So it's really important that we that we have our nasal cavity for that filtering, warming, moistening of that air before it reaches our delicate lung tissue. So these airways are all lined with mucus which helps to warm and moisten the air, but it's the blood vessels particularly that warm it. It's the mucus that moistens it. So then we also look um, at the back here. Um, this is what we call our throat. The clinical name for the throat is the pharynx. So it's pharynx, P-H-A-R-Y-N-X, pharynx, and that is important for like I said, um, bringing that air into the airways, but food is also passing here through the pharynx. So when food enters the mouth here, here's the tongue. So this is the oral cavity, and we see that the hard palate and the soft palate divide the nasal cavity from the oral cavity. So as food passes down here, it enters the oral pharynx. This is the nasal pharynx. So this is the back of the throat where food does not does not enter. And then there's this um, soft palate here, and the tip of that is called the uvula. And when we swallow, the uvula moves backward and closes off this nasal pharynx so we don't get food up here in our nasal cavity. And up in the nasal pharynx, at the top, at the start of the pharynx, is the, are the adenoids, and those are tonsils that help to filter the air and you know prevent infection of these mucous membranes. So um, some people with chronic respiratory infections end up having to get their adenoids removed, but um, it's helpful to keep them intact as long as they don't get clogged with bacteria and and you know immune cells. Um, it's good for preventing infection, but if they get too large, sometimes they can, you know, close off the airway a little bit, cause snoring, cause difficulty breathing, and then those people need to get those adenoids removed. So if we continue down here, here's the oral pharynx, and in the walls of the oral pharynx are the palatine tonsils. So this line is kind of covering that, but embedded in the wall on either side of the oral pharynx are the palatine tonsils. If you've ever had strep throat and you opened up your mouth, you might see those large swellings on either side of the oral pharynx. And those are the palatine tonsils. Again, some people need to get those removed as well because of snoring or difficulties with chronic infections. So that's the pharynx. Pharynx is another name for the throat. Right here it's a common passageway for both food and air once we get behind the oral pharynx. And then we get into the airways. So behind here is the esophagus. That heads to the digestive tract. But in front here is the, is the 
is the trachea below and the larynx above. Above the larynx is a special flap of cartilage. It's called the epiglottis. Whoops. Lost my slide there. And that uh, prevents food from going into the pharynx. So if I go down to our next slide here, it's a little bigger. So here's the, the palatine tonsils, like I said, that are found on either side of your throat if you open up your mouth. And here's the oral pharynx. And this is, the, like I said, the epiglottis. And what the epiglottis does is it covers the airway when we swallow and prevents food from going into the trachea and causing choking. Instead, the food continues on behind the airways, down the esophagus, and into the stomach. So we have the epiglottis, that cartilage covering the larynx when we swallow. The, the larynx rises up and that flap of cartilage covers this passageway. And then we get into the, the airway. So this whole region here where your voice box, where your vocal cords is located, is called the larynx. So this whole cartilaginous region here is the larynx. And then in there, in the larynx, are the vocal cords, and the space between the vocal cords is called the glottis. And we'll look up that on the next slide. But then again, we have the trachea, which is held open by rings of cartilage here, which is helpful for, keep, again, keeping that airway open. So be aware, you know, of the different regions of the respiratory tract. Again, we have the nasal cavity, the adenoids up here in the um, upper nasal cavity, and then we have the pharynx, which is the throat, the nasopharynx with the uvula, which blocks off the nasopharynx when we swallow. This presses against the back wall. Then we have the oral pharynx where the food is. And then the laryngopharynx, which is right here behind the larynx, and then the air is is directed down into this airway. So if we look at the um, a little further down in the larynx, if you look down someone's throat, this is what you would see. These are the vocal cords that are on either side. So here are the vocal cords made of like a ligament type tissue and they vibrate when air passes through them air has to pass from the inside out in order for those vocal cords to vibrate properly and the space between the vocal cords is called the glottis. So the glottis is, is a space, it's not a specific structure, it's just the space between the vocal cords. And we know when we make our vocal cords very tight and we make that glottis very narrow, we get high pitch sounds. And when we open up the glottis and make the space between these vocal cords very large, then that makes for a very low sound. So men have a larger larynx and a larger glottis compared to women, so therefore men typically have lower voices. Um, some people can get inflammation of the vocal cords and have what we call tonsillitis, or not tonsillitis, sorry, um, laryngitis, because the vocal cords are vo located in the larynx. Um, it's an inflammation of the vocal cords and that's called laryngitis. So people with laryngitis have to drink lots of fluids and rest their voice. Whispering is the worst thing for laryngitis because whispering causes the vocal cords to work and stretch a little tighter and that is harder on the vocal cords when they need to heal. So the epiglottis is again is that flap of cartilage that would close the larynx, close off the vocal cords and the passageway to the airways. This is just a little piece of it shown here. So going back up here, so this is the larynx, like I said, the glottis is the space between the vocal cords and then you have your vocal cords on either side. So if we look at the, the tissue that makes up the um, airways, we see it's a special type of tissue. It's called pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. So it's quite a mouthful. But we can see that there's all of these cells, these, they're, they look like uh, they're stratified, like they're piled on top of each other. So they have kind of an odd appearance. That's why they're called pseudostratified. And then they have the cilia on the surface. And the cilia um, helps to move the mucus upward toward the digestive tract so it can be swallowed. And so that mucus with the debris doesn't um, end up in the airways. So here's just a particle that might be suspended in the air that we breathe as it gets caught on the mucous membrane of our airways, the cilia again will beat it up toward the digestive tract. So if you look back at this picture here, we have cilia in the lining the nose. The cilia are going to beat that mucus backwards toward the back of the nasopharynx and we're going to swallow it down to the esophagus. However, the cilia in the trachea, those are going to beat the mucus upward toward the larynx and every now and then you feel that you're urged to clear your throat which is going to move that mucus up again into the pharynx and it'll be swallowed down. So the, the cilia in the airways beat upward and the cilia in the nasal cavity beats backward, all directing that 
that mucus with those trapped particles into the pharynx and down into the esophagus, where mucus is helpful in moving food through our digestive tract. But it's not helpful to have a lot of mucus and trapped particles in our airways, because if that settles into the lungs, that can interfere with gas exchange. So we have special cells that are kind of interspersed among these pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial cells, and these are called goblet cells. So goblet cells, their job is to secrete mucus, just secreting it to the surface so that it creates that, that viscous or that kind of slippery surface um, of the of the respiratory tract. And we don't want this to be too viscous because viscous refers to the resistance to flow. So thick, sticky mucus is not good for clearing our airways effectively, but a nice slippery thin mucus is ideal. So when people are sick, sometimes that mucus production gets a little heavier. It's important that they drink fluids to thin that mucus out and allow that cilia to direct that mucus again toward the digestive tract. So we'll go back to our, our PowerPoint notes here. So moving on down the down the the tract, then, um, well, let's start with let's divide these uh, structures. So first of all, the upper respiratory tract then is the nasal cavity, the pharynx, and the larynx, and the nasal cavity opens at the nostrils, which are called the nares, and that leads to the nasal cavity. And we know that the nasal cavity there's you know there's two nostrils which are divided by a septum, and that's the the space between your nostrils that that cartilage and bone there. And then the, the cilia is what will filter and trap air particles in that region. So this is the upper respiratory tract. So air comes in, comes down, into the larynx. And once it passes the larynx, then we get into the lower respiratory tract. So we know that we already talked about that it's lined with mucous membranes to trap particles. And that mucus layer also has lots of capillaries near the surface that will warm the air. So warming the air is important, again, for protecting those delicate lungs when the air gets down there. And some people, you know, tend to get nosebleeds pretty easily. If they have a lot of capillaries near the surface and that are somewhat fragile, some people tend uh, to have more nosebleeds than others, especially if the air in the nose is dry because of winter weather and, and dry air in the house. So. Um, we also have sensory receptors in the nasal cavity for detecting odors. And we also have a duct that goes from the eye into the nasal cavity. So when you cry or your eyes water, that, that fluid comes from the eye right down into the nasal cavity and out the nose. So that's why when if you cry or have watery eyes, you end up having um, running out the nose as well. And then above the, the nasal cavity, there's some spaces in the skull, which we call the sinuses. So that's up here. So these are just uh, open areas inside the bones of the skull that help to allow for good resonation of your speech when you're talking and uh, lightens the weight of the skull. So sometimes these get in full, full of, of mucus and bacteria and cause a sinus infection. If you've ever had a sinus infection, you know how uncomfortable that can be. And that is just clogged mucus and fluid that fills up these bony spaces in the skull. And there's uh, one over the forehead, and there's two, um, a couple on either side of the nose. And those can, when they get full of fluid, they can cause headache, they can cause your teeth to hurt, um, the upper teeth, based on the location, and uh, the bony portion on either side of your nose, based on those locations of those sinuses. So people at risk for sinus infections are people with chronic allergies and smokers because they lose functional cilia due to chronic exposure to cigarette smoke. So moving on then, we talked about the nasopharynx um, as that area of the throat right behind the nose. And then the eustachian tube is that tube that connects the, the middle ear to the nasopharynx. So if a child gets an ear infection, there is a small passageway that goes from the nasopharynx to the middle ear. So when um, kids, you know, children have kind of narrow eustachian tubes during childhood, what happens is that um, eustachian tube gets blocked with mucus and then the uh, bacteria from the nasal cavity pass through the eustachian tube and infect the middle ear. So it's a real problem among children. So it's not shown very well on this diagram, but this, this here is a little base of that passageway that goes to the middle ear. So kids with narrow 
your station tubes end up with lots of chronic ear infections and they might need tubes to keep that middle ear open to the outside so they can put um, antibacterial drops in there. We'll get into more of that when we get into the special senses with the nervous system. <coughs> So we talked about the pharynx is the throat, um, the three regions, the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. The tonsils are on either side of the oropharynx. Those are called the palatine tonsils, and those are important for fighting off infection. Talked about the larynx, that's that structure um, where the vocal cords are located. And the space between the vocal cords is the glottis. Looked at this picture already, so I'll just um, talked about the epiglottis is that flap of tissue that prevents food from passing into the larynx. So again, looking at this picture here, this is the epiglottis. So moving back then, uh, looking in the lower respiratory tract, then that begins with the trachea, and then the bronchi, and moving into the bronchioles eventually that lead to the lungs. So we looked at the cells you know, that line that trachea, have that ciliated, pseudostratified columnar epithelium for trapping debris, along with those blue-shaped, or blue-colored in this diagram, goblet cells, and their job is to secrete mucus. So that's the tissue of the um, airway, the upper, or the lower, first lower airway, the trachea. Um, some people need a breathing tube, you know, for ventilation. Oh, that's called a tracheostomy when they have to make that incision at the base of the throat. And then if we look at the bronchi below the trachea, they break into two bronchi leading to each of the lungs. So going back to here, we can move to our next diagram here. Actually, we'll move up here. So we have the, the trachea and then the bronchi are these two large passageways and then the bronchi branch into secondary bronchi. So the first branch of these large bronchi here, the first branchings are called the, the secondary bronchi. And then they branch again, these many branches you see, those are the tertiary bronchi. And then they branch and branch even further until they become bronchioles. And bronchioles are the smallest of airways that lead to the lungs. And they don't have any cartilage to keep them open. So uh, the trachea has C-shaped cartilage, so it's covered in cartilage on the front side, but not on the back side because of the esophagus is behind there, and we need that to be open for food to pass down between breathing or between breaths. So it's the, the, the trachea, the bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, and then eventually becoming bronchioles. So the bronchioles, because they don't have any cartilage lining and only smooth muscle, they eventually um, can be prone to you know, constriction, contraction, causing smaller airways, and that's what is the problem with asthma, is the smooth muscle of those bronchioles contract and constrict it and cause lots of difficulty with breathing, and it's a real problem with people that suffer from that chronic condition. So then eventually that bronchial will lead to the alveoli. So if we look at this nice picture here, this is a bronchial. This is the last airway before we lead into the air sacs of the lungs. So the alveoli are these small structures that make up the lung tissue. So the lungs are essentially millions of alveoli in clusters that are surrounded by blood vessels where the gas exchange occurs. So here's the bronchial that again opens up into these alveoli. So the bronchial has smooth muscle only holding it open. So if the smooth muscle is relaxed, these airways are nice and open and breathing is very you know, easy and smooth. But if the, if the airways constrict, the, the smooth muscle constricts, that's going to cause difficulty in movement of air in, into and out of the alveoli. So we'll stop at this point and we'll pick up in um, our lecture video number two.